Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure <coughs> to uh, introduce to you a man behind a great brand. And I know when a brand is great, when somebody here yesterday morning told me that they couldn't be here today and they were so sorry they couldn't make the Quicksilver presentation by Harry Hodge. Because this woman actually loves this brand. And ten years ago, or I think maybe probably about six years ago, had Quicksilver tattooed onto her posterior. <laughs> and I've known her for about uh, ten years. And I said, I've never noticed. <laughs> but anyway, for obvious reasons. Okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, Quicksilver is one of those heart brands, you know, the well-felt, loved brands. And uh, when you look at it, when you hear this presentation, you will see a, a CSR spirit and a CSR program rising from the very roots of this brand and what it stands for, as opposed to, you know, we, we're now getting on to coach, uh, CSR initiatives. Harry is one of the founders of Quicksilver. Yeah, it's regarded as one of the world's leading apparel brands. It was fa founded in Torquay in Victoria in 1969. One doesn't realize that. And today has a stable of brands that include Roxy, uh, Rossignol, Skis, Cleveland Golf, and DC Skate Shoes. It's listed on the New York Stock Exchange now with annual sales of about $3 billion. Harry, uh, for an Australian, this is interesting, was based in France for about 20 years. 20 years, uh, where he, he built Quicksilver from, uh, from nothing, or $1 million to a $500 million business. And uh, that is, uh, says a whole lot for this brand and a whole lot of other developments. He's today still active in the company uh, as an advisor. He is passionate about uh, their corporate social responsibility initiatives, as you will see and hear, and hopefully uh, have an interest in yourself. So without any further ado, let's welcome Harry Hodge. Thanks, Rob. The uh, Forte PR machine works well. What you see here on the screen is the Quicksilver logo. It represents a mountain and a wave. Actually, it's the front cover of the Quicksilver uh, history book we've just released that's titled The Mountain and the Wave. But there's another mountain and another wave I'd like to talk about today. The mountain is the one we all have to climb to meet the challenges and take responsibility <clears throat> for what we do and the way we do it. The wave is the one that is breaking right now. In 2006, we have a rising consciousness and concern for the environment and humanity. And let's hope this wave reaches tsunami-like proportions. It seems for the first time we have ex-presidents, environmentalists, politicians, actors, musicians, surfers, skater, skaters and the like all urging change and action before it's too late. Even Rupert Murdoch broke ranks recently and admitted something needs to be done. Hopefully by sharing our story and telling you a bit about the Quicksilver Foundation and Surf Aid International, I can add value to this immensely important summit here today. I don't know if I can live up to my intro on the, uh, the agenda and schedule of telling you how Quicksilver built a global company by intimately understanding what our stakeholders needed or wanted. However, from the beginning, back in 1969, what we thought we knew was understanding what our customer values were. By understanding this, Quicksilver's history has been based on selling the truth, promoting the lifestyle and staying true to our core beliefs. So what is our core belief? We believe if you want a great company, you cannot use your marketing to promote a falsehood. We believe a great company uses its marketing to do good. And that in turn gives the customer a reason to remain loyal to the brand. And when your brand depends on the health of the oceans and the mountains, like Quicksilver's does, and especially when your logo happens to be the mountain and wave, 
I guess applying the CSR ethic was absolutely essential. Our respect for the board sports playgrounds has led us to wide-ranging commitment to protect the environment and the ecology. And we knew this would give our customer further reason to remain loyal to the brand. One of the initiatives we're most proud of at Quicksilver is called the Quicksilver Crossing. It's a round-the-world voyage of discovery. The crossing was launched with the end objective in mind, that being to make a difference to the local cultures and the environment we work and play in. What's so great about the crossing is it's something that our customers can see and touch. It is something that can be measured and it has had an immense impact on our marketing and our stakeholders. And right now I'd like to show you some images from the crossing that will explain this voyage of discovery far better than I can. We've had a few technical glitches, but being and Heath here, I'm sure I'll work it out quickly. Despite all the science, all the satellites, and all the maps in the world, there are still hundreds of islands and vast stretches of coastline that hold waves that no one has ever ridden. Waves that break perfectly on nameless reefs in warm equatorial waters. Waves so good that they redefine what the surfing world understands as the perfect wave. Finding and surfing these pristine waves is the dream of every surfer. But there are no shortcuts. The only way to do it is to get out there and explore. In March 1999 in Sydney, Australia, Quicksilver, the world's leading board riding company, launched the Quicksilver Crossing, a voyage of exploration and discovery aboard the most famous charter vessel in the history of surfing, the Indies Trader. The Indies Trader and her captain, Martin Daly, have been responsible for some of the world's most important surf discoveries. It's just going around that corner and checking it out and seeing what it's like. That's the spirit. That's the spirit of the crossing to me. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty simple. Basic. And it keeps every cell in your body alive. That spirit. Well, the crossing is about discovering, uh, finding new waves, getting a, basically away from the, the world of surfing that we know, and uh, discovering something new, getting clean water and checking out different cultures and diving, fishing, just living in the ocean basically, living from the ocean and, and, and uh, amongst it and um, not taking it for granted. The Quicksilver Crossing has three objectives in its mission statement. First and foremost, to explore the world's oceans for surf. To date, the crossing has found more than 90 world-class waves, which as far as we know, have never been surfed before. Secondly, to contribute to the health of the environment in which we work and play. This has been achieved by Quicksilver's collaboration with the United Nations supported coral monitoring program, ReefCheck. ReefCheck's marine biologists utilize the Quicksilver Crossing's resources to study coral reefs which otherwise would be too remote to access any other way. Having a major company with a high profile like Quicksilver get involved and stick their neck out and say yes we think that reefs are important we'd like to help out as part of our mission to 
uh, spread the word about surfing, discovery of new surf spots, that we'd also like to do some environmental good and help to conserve these coral reefs. That has been a tremendously valuable thing and has, and has received the highest level of recognition in the United Nations. What I hope to achieve is the fabulous adventure of being in places that are so remote, places I'd never have an opportunity to see or visit or surf, to ride a wave, maybe to be the first human being to ever ride a wave. Can you imagine that? Thirdly, to have empathy for the local culture and customs. That is, leave only our footprints in the sand and nothing more. A key to this is minimizing any possible exploitation of new surf discoveries by keeping the exact locations a closely guarded secret. Since its launch in 1999, the Quicksilver Crossing has traveled more than 70,000 nautical miles, which is more than three laps around the globe. It has explored the archipelagos of Southeast Asia, French Polynesia, the outer reefs of the Indian Ocean and the islands and coastlines of Africa. It has traveled through the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean, then retraced Christopher Columbus's voyage to the New World, across the Atlantic to explore the coasts of South America, Central America and the Cays and Atolls of the Caribbean. In virtually every region the Quicksilver Crossing has visited, it's discovered incredible ways, often in places where the maps and local knowledge would suggest that nothing would be found. Nowhere has this been truer than in Central America, where the Quicksilver Crossing found empty, world-class waves peeling along deserted, pristine beaches. It's like anywhere new and different, and uh, you've never been before, it has a different smell and flavor in every way. Pretty much is finding new waves, surfing them, uh, get to know new cultures, interact with people, and you know how the way how they live. The spirit behind the crossing is one that. Basically, it's about dreaming, it's about inspiration when you think about it, you know. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to come up with the money to go on an international surf voyage on a yacht, but it could mean just as much as, you know, next weekend driving up the coast and looking at a new break and, you know, experience some new element of surfing. So it's, you know, it, it's, in its inspirational sense, it already has changed surfing. The crossing has already achieved its main objectives and more. It has crossed oceans through doldrums and typhoons. It has investigated reefs so remote that scientists barely knew they existed. It has discovered ways where people were certain there were none. And it has made friends that will never be forgotten. The journey of discovery continues as the Quicksilver Crossing heads into the waters of mainland America. I guess that's the fun part about CSR also. We set up the Quicksilver Foundation to support various charitable and environmental causes, especially causes like the Bali Bombing Fund and the Tsunami Relief Fund. As the Quicksilver Foundation was formed, we spent a lot of time trying to determine what its objective should be. So what does the Quicksilver Foundation stand for? As you can see on this slide, it's about making a difference. What does it aim to do? It aims to support environmental, educational and health related projects. And all of this comes directly, what we believe, out of the value of our brand. In doing this, we again came back to what would our stakeholders want us to do? In asking that question, it became pretty obvious that Quicksilver as a company must ensure the Quicksilver Foundation evolves into one of the most important elements of our brand. One of the questions we often ask ourselves at Quicksilver is, 
If our customer had full knowledge of the decisions we made, would they approve? By applying this ethic, we avoid indecision and half-decision based on half-truth. The Quicksilver Crossing is a great example of this. When we received a special environmental award for the crossing from the United Nations, this was confirmation that all this goodwill marketing made good business sense. As corporate operations become based on collaboration and networks, we are all pretty much transparent in every respect. And this enables the customer to determine if a company is worth their loyalty. As we know, more and more customers are asking questions like, is a company's supply chain ethical? Does the company manufacture in countries with feeble labour and environmental laws or oppressive political regimes? Is child labour an issue? What is the message here? Clearly, transparency is paramount. Today, as we have seen with some companies, the sins of the most distant outsourced production plant can rise up and smear a brand. In respect to all of this, and it's been mentioned here today, an increasing number of Fortune 500 companies in the US are reporting on what is called the triple bottom line, financial, environmental and social. Thanks to unprecedented access to information, today's consumer is fast becoming a consumer activist. Therefore, it is fundamental our clients, our customers and our shareholders are comfortable with our ethics. The forma formation of the Quicksilver Foundation has had a profound impact on how Quicksilver thinks, what we do as a company, and how our stakeholders view us. So our mindset to make a difference has become a reality, and today leads us to support many causes. For example, in America, we have over 100 regional initiatives, from school programs to the Special Olympics to the Red Cross. In Australia, we have initiatives that go from supporting the Starlight Foundation to Care Australia to MS Research. Then we have our global initiatives. These include our breast cancer awareness campaign called Keep Abreast. This campaign is carried right throughout our Roxy brand. And also one of our most important global initiatives is the support of SurfAid International, the SurfAid's humanitarian agency of choice. So what is SurfAid? I think the best way to explain this is to share a story with you about one man's clarity and vision while the rest of us couldn't see the forest for the trees. Pardon the pun, but you'll, you'll understand why a little bit later on. In 2002... I was invited as a keynote speaker at a surf industry summit in Mexico. We're the surf industry. So this summit is more, probably more of an excuse to get together, surf, have a good time, party, and if we're not too hungover, attend some of the seminars and presentations. As I said, we're the surf industry. At that summit, following my address, which I thought was pretty good, was an address and video by SurfAid's founder, Dr. Dave Jenkins. I learnt two things that day. The first being that I would never again precede anyone with such a strong vision and a clear message for a noble cause. Dr. Ta Dave's presentation was so compelling that mine was soon a distant memory. But more importantly, the second thing I learnt is that the surf industry had been myopic as we sent our surfers and photographers to one of the world's best surf areas, the Mentawai Island chain in Indonesia. Why were we myopic? There we were filming isolated waves breaking over pristine coral reefs, whilst just behind the palm trees and white sand beaches, there was extreme poverty and health issues with the local communities. Five in 10 parents had lost a child. The surf industry had been promoting a falsehood. 
I came across a great quote recently from the wartime diary of Anne Frank. It read, How wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. That day in Mexico, the surf industry wasted no time in coming together in non-partisan support for surf aid to improve our world. My explanation of surf aid doesn't do the, the organisation justice, so we'll put another brief DVD on here which shows the great work that Surf Aid International does in our region. Thanks, Ian. This tropical wonderland in the islands off West Sumatra offers surfers deep crystal barrels and amazing scenery. Every surfer who visits feels a childlike exuberance in this ocean version of Disneyland. However, just metres from this playground, the lives of Indonesian kids are far from exuberant. They are dying from the ravages of malaria, dysentery, measles, malnutrition and diarrhoea. All preventable, all treatable. Surf Aid International was founded on the principles that health education, disease prevention and health infrastructure would make a difference in the lives of these island people. Less than two years ago, Surf Aid asked for help from the surf industry. They stepped up on the spot with recognition, commitment and funding that helped put Surf Aid on the map as their humanitarian organisation of choice. Our mission together was to create sustainable improvements in the health and well-being of the Mentawai people. Who would have guessed that in December of 2004 that this mission would expand so dramatically? Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I wanted to give you an update on the situation in South Asia as a result of the tsunami and the loss of life that was so tragic. I have just uh, been on the phone a few moments ago with President Bush. I have also talked in the course of the last uh, 18 hours to my counterparts in Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Thailand, India, and Malaysia to reinforce our offers of assistance. The December 26th earthquake and tsunami annihilated coastal communities throughout the Indian Ocean. The tsunami was not democratic in its path. The Mentawai Islands were miraculously spared. However, the islands to their north were badly hit. Nias, the Hanakos and Similu had almost identical socio-economic landscapes to the Mentawais. And like the Mentawais, these islands were well known to the surf community and renowned for perfect surf. This dream destination was met with its worst nightmare. If there was ever a time for the surfing community to give back to these people, it was now. So you're talking about communities that are very disempowered. Um, they have spent generations of having stuff happen to them. What is the mindset that allows somebody to sit back and watch another die? Well, the mindset is that there's never been anything that they could do about it. It was only ever a wait and see if they heal scenario. We in the West have the knowledge that there's people that we can go to immediately to be able to address just about any health situation. So um, being able to transform that pattern of behaviour and that philosophical, deep-rooted philosophical understanding is a slow but very sure process of empowerment. SurfAid's local expertise and relationships with local surf charter companies ideally position them to respond immediately to this emergency. In just one week, SurfAid geared up to respond to one of the biggest natural disasters of the century. In one month, SurfAid more than tripled the reach and scope of their current operations and rose to the challenge of launching its first ever full-scale medical emergency relief effort. Surf industry giants Quicksilver and Billabong took the lead on funding the efforts as platinum donors. The global surfing community followed, flooding SurfAid with more individual donations than they had received in the last five years combined. The main thing I suppose was, if nothing else, that I could help promote what they do and, and help spread the word and that's been a fantastic experience to be able to hopefully you know, spread that word to people and see the good that they're doing. This is the core of the industry. These people, these CEOs, the staff, the marketing teams, the people that make the money, down to the clerks at the you know, Quicksilver Billabong shop, a lot of these people have either been here 
They've certainly read the pictures, they're up on the walls, they've seen the videos, they can relate to this area. So there's, there's a heartfelt plus plus and uh, I think that was a, you know, a huge part of the fact that they called us. However, Surf Aid's job is far from done. As if this culture had not already endured enough hardship, on March 28, 2005, an earthquake registering 8.7 on the Richter scale further devastated these small islands. The damage this time around was exponentially worse. Surf Aid diverted their long-term program plans and shifted immediately back into emergency mode with effective results. Together with impassioned donors, volunteers and a dedicated team, we are turning tragedy into an opportunity for far better health and an improved standard of living. 150,000 people serviced through the Hanakos, Nias and Similu. 11,000 children immunised in over 50 villages. 300 tonnes of emergency aid distributed. 2,500 people treated for injuries or illness. Conducted search and rescue missions in over 20 villages. Surf Aid would like to thank the surf industry for making these achievements possible and for helping us save lives today and into the future. This is just the beginning of our journey together. With your support, we are making a long-term commitment to rebuild health in these regions. A wave of compassion. We've got an industry that have just powered behind this thing. We've got a community that's powered behind it. There is just a, tri it's a tribe out there surfing and it, it crosses all sorts of cultural, geographic, ethnic boundaries. It's not Quicksilver or Billabong sponsoring Surf Aid. It, it's Quicksilver and Billabong and our Surf Aid and so is Hurley and Reef and, and Seema and the surfer down the road that gave 20 bucks. That's what we are. Today, Surf Aid is a wave of compassion powered at the core by the global surfing community. Get on it. Visit www.surfaidinternational.org for more details. Thanks. I'd like to make mention too, the, the annual budget of Surf Aid is less than $4 million Australian dollars and we're supported by AusAid and NZAid, but as you can see the effect that it has is vastly more than those sums of money. And all of this we talked about is the challenge in climbing the mountain and taking that wave. Being involved with Surf Aid has allowed Quicksilver through our foundation to broaden our efforts and continue to build stakeholder confidence. And in the process for over 35 years, we've been the build leader in building a global surf industry with surfing and related board sports. Today, global sales of this industry exceeds $8 billion, with four surf companies publicly listed. I'd say from our humble beginnings in Torquay, Quicksilver's exceeded its expectations, as have Billabong, Rip Curl and many other surf industry companies. One question though that comes up is where do we go from here? As we all know in business, there is nothing better than when you have absolute knowledge on how to base your business decisions. So I guess this should be part, become part of the where do we go from here plan. However, today there are some very disturbing knowns, which brings us back to the mountain and wave. Sir Nicholas Stern, the man behind the controversial report into global warming, has stated that he knows Australia's Great Barrier Reef will die. And we know from our reef check program on the crossing, this is a real possibility. Surf Aid and the seismologists in Indonesia say they know it's not a matter of if there'll be another major earthquake in that region, simply a matter of when. We know Australia is gripped in its biggest drought in history. And we know if we keep emitting greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases, we're going to see icebergs floating up, up Sydney Harbour just like there are off the southern tip of New Zealand. All these supposed knowns are viewed by some cynics as simply as plausible as the end of the world naysayers or the famous Y2K bug that never happened. Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, was received by some cynics as simply tabloid film fodder 
put out by the climate change trendies. Personally, I'm amazed at how we can be so complacent about all of this. However, as I said at the start, there is a wave of rising consciousness and therefore hope. Rupert Murdoch, a famous global warming cynic, said recently, quote, Even if there is only a 30% chance the experts could be right, we should do everything we can to avoid a bad outcome. Unquote. Then in an unprecedented move, Mr Murdoch gave half a million dollars to Bill Clinton's global initiative to combat global warming. The ex-president, through his initiative, has mobilised and galvanised such people like Richard Branson, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Bono, along with many more global heavyweights, to support his cause. Mr Clinton says, quote, I have great faith in our collective power to make a significant and lasting difference. We owe it to our children and our children's children to try. And that's the challenge for each of us. I'd like to conclude today by sharing a story with you. At a surf industry function recently, I was asked why I was so passionate about CSR, the Quicksilver Foundation, SurfAid and the environment. Beyond the corporate challenges I faced as CEO and Chairman running Quicksilver Europe, my simple answer is it makes me feel good. And people always do things that make them feel good. So that's what I'm going to keep doing. However, sometimes in respect to this, I also ask myself a rather self-indulgent question. That is until my wife reminds me I'm not as important as I think I am. <laughs> the question is, how do I want to be remembered? As a CEO who was part of building a multi-billion dollar business and increasing shareholder value? Sure I do, and I'm immensely proud of that or as someone who has also made a difference to humanity? The answer came easy. You've heard my story. Now I'd love to hear from you, your questions, your comments, your opinions. So I'll open the floor up to questions, Rob. Thanks for that. I just, I'm Michelle Leonard. I'm from World Vision and I head up the domestic program in Australia. I'd just like to thank you really for reminding us all here. We've, um, there's been a lot of talk about um, business and companies being ethical but really ethics goes way beyond just what we do at work and it goes right into our private lives as well so I think that's a very important factor that we all have to remember and just in the work that I do in working with Aboriginal communities if, if it wasn't an important um, part of my life and had, you know, to have a real understanding about Aboriginal culture for me to go into a workplace and work in that area would be impossible. So even just for your own integrity around that, you know, around what you're doing is just so important. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Sue Donnelly from New South Wales University. I was just interested in what was the initial motivation of the crossing and whether it was in fact just about trying to go out and get some good waves because everything had been explored and that the, um, then the environmental awareness came later or whether the environmental awareness was part of it at the beginning? It, it, st it all started together and to be quite candid, we didn't realise how the environmental awareness part would expand. But once we started, we weren't sure what we were supposed to do, but we knew we had to do something. And then through our networking, the marine biologists ca came on board and... At the start, one of our things was we've got to have a marine biologist on board for insurance, just to make sure we are seen to be doing something and we will do something. But then Reef Check came on board and it kind of you know, compounded and had a domino effect like that. And then it involved all our athletes, Kelly Slater, Lisa Anderson, you know, everyone that came on the crossing. They actually they could do something instead of just sitting on the boat and watching the biologists do the stuff they could actually go down diving and record the, reef, the state of the reefs themselves. So it, 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 we did start out with that in mind, but we had no idea where it would end up. So we're pretty proud of the, uh, the snowball effect it had. Sorry, following on from that. And so do you have a queue of people now trying to get onto the crossing? We're <laughs> we've actually we're, we've, we've discontinued the actual concept of the crossing. We believe the crossing can be 
a bus going to the mountains with some environmentalists on board. We have four or five boats now that continue the same thing. The original boat, the Indies Trader, is becoming like a museum piece, but it's not in a museum yet, it's still in the ocean. So we've actually expanded it and we've, you know, anything could be the crossing. So we're not just saying it's on a boat anymore. It could be um, a vast majority of things. It could be an aeroplane, it could be a train. You know, where, where you, it's the journey. But when you take the journey, make sure you think about the cause and effect of the environment, the local cultures, and all that sort of thing. Oh, hi. Uh, Amanda Little, One at a Time Foundation. I'm just curious in terms of the, the building of these um, environmental values into your brand. Have you, through your research and, and just your, your market, your sales and things, got any evidence of how that's impacting on the value of the brand and the actual business of your business? You know, we, we don't because we don't really try because one of the things we decided with the foundation and CSR, we weren't going to beat our chest about it. I mean, I can come here today and beat my chest because we're in a, a, a good environment where we're doing that, but we don't go out and brag about it. We don't, um, you know, it, we want that to be come from underground and word of mouth. And so, therefore, it's hard to quantify and measure. But as I said, we've always had this feeling we know what our customer values and we especially today's customer, you know, the consumer activist, you know, they're asking those hard questions. And we, we're pretty proud of the fact that, you know, we've been proactive on it, as has most of the surf industry companies, Billabong, Rip Curl. Um, we've all got programs going. I guess I'm just coming at it from the point of view of convincing other clothing manufacturers or persuading or motivating other clothing manufacturers to be more environmentally sensitive in the way they produce clothes and market them and... I think, I think we're in a, a very comfortable position because our industry is the surf industry, the oceans and the mountains, so it's just logical. A company like Levi's or Gap or, you know, I think, you know, they've got to go the more corporate route. As I said, we're pretty lucky to be able to do what we do. Um, I don't know. I hope that, you know, the more our message gets out that other companies are inspired to become original and think, how can they do it? And... <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sure a lot of companies... I know GAP has great CR prog CSR programs in America. Just um, you, you gave some good examples of how um, the companies reached out. Do you have any very tangible examples of how you've looked inward more and looked at the, your sustainability in an inward sense in terms of you know, the products that you make and the work you might have done with your supply chain and, and, and so on? Or has the main focus been reaching out in things like surf aid and No, no we, we do go back in and in some respects going back in is harder than the reaching out part of it be obviously because you saw the images because you'd, we're now dealing with well, what everyone else deals with, you know the products and fabric we use are pollutant you know, um, but we're not going to manage, a, you know, run a business for three billion dollars selling hemp clothing so, so it, it, you, we go back in, we look at the, the supply chain, the ethics, the products we make within our own companies, the recycling plants. You know, we do pretty much what most corporate companies do because we're a corporate company. So a lot of people have the misperception that Quicksilver is not a normal company. You know, $3 billion annual turnover list on the stock exchange, we're about as corporate as you can get. So, but, the, but we do try and go back in, but that's harder than the, the outreach programs. Thank you, Harry. I was wondering about uh, how you developed an ethical supply chain, how you're actually auditing it, um, and monitoring that and how you embedded human rights within, within the organisation. Can I, I you expand a little more on that? Yeah. It's a follow-on. Yeah. I, 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 to be honest, we, we don't audit because it's impossible to audit in, in, in the world we're operating. What we do, we have contracts in place. Um, we have ethical pro standards, trade practices in place. We have the, the, our best efforts. We have quality control people. We have... Um, we have regular, um, we bring our, our factory managers to, to our head office regularly. Um, but can you supply, can you control that factory that's in India? We do our best, like everyone. Um, and, and I think the whole corporate world that is manufacturing in any of these countries is, is doing uh, better and better at this sort of uh, job. But so do you do on-site inspections at all, yep. any of your management? Yeah, we have SNAP inspections. No. Thank you. Okay. Well, before I wrap up, um, I just, uh, one, sorry. I just have a question over here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I'd just like to know. 
I get it. Listening to you, I have a sense that you actually own this project around your CSR project. And um, I, the, the question that's there for me is, why do you do it? I know you said it makes you feel good, but what is it that you're feeling good about? Me personally or the company? Yeah, no, you. Um, you know, I was talking to Steve Drury here before, and I know Steve quite well, and, and we talk about this a bit, basically because I'm pretty lazy. <laughs> so to get out of being a CEO and a chairman, I build a succession plan, moving back to Australia with my family. I feel well, I'd better make myself relevant and do something. So I thought this... That, but in all honesty, I've always been passionate about this. From the mid-90s, um, I've just had this belief that, you know, maybe it was a gene I inherited from a great-grandmother or something. I don't know. But I had this belief that, you know, we've got to do good. It's not about giving back. It's just... Uh, and I think uh, Mike Kiley, Michael Kiley said it before. It's, you know, about the karma of it. You know, it's about the, you know, the good aspect of it. It's not the accumulation. And it's about... I'm in a very fortunate position at my stage in my life and my career where I have a great work-life balance, I have a flexible uh, work regime, and I can put as much time as necessary into SurfAid. I'm on the board of SurfAid International, the Quicksilver Foundation, and it, because I think it does good and it makes me feel really good, and it's pretty hard to miss a quarter and have the shareholders come down on you. <laughs> so, Great. Thank you very much. Just to wrap up here too... Um, I, you know, I, I wish everyone luck here today in the, in the mountain. Uh, we've got to climb in the wave. Um, I've talked about two possibilities here, the Quicksilver Foundation and SurfAid. And if anyone here would like to get involved, please don't hesitate to contact me because we have global reach on these programs. They're not, they're not prior, you know, just personal Quicksilver projects. And whatever you guys choose to do in the room here, I wish you well in you know, taking that mountain, climbing the wave. And if I can do anything to help, um, don't hesitate to contact me because we love sharing information and uh, exchanging ideas. So thanks very much. Thank you, Harry. Having one-on-one uh, -on -one opportunities with, with Harry, uh, he does speak from the heart. He does believe this stuff. It's one of the first things he said to me. We don't trumpet this stuff around. Uh, we just do it which is terrific. Um, a couple of issues are coming out of that for me, which was the uh, Siobhan this morning spoke about symbolism, and you think of the symbolism of the crossing, and actually it applies to our crossing. You know, we are crossing from here to there, from uh, lagging behind in CSR to maybe being a country at the forefront of CSR. Hopefully that's our crossing.